Hello, welcome to my uh, first video discussion for you concerning 1 Corinthians. Um, I doubt I'm going to get through it all in one video, so it might end up being two. I'll make one today. I'll make a second one, hopefully Thursday. Um, we've done 1 and 2 Thessalonians. We've done the background and everything. We've done that with Galatians as well. Now we come to 1 um, Corinthians. We'll do 1 Corinthians in the next couple days, and then 2 Corinthians later on. Let's just jump right in. Uh, if you look at the stuff that I've given you, there's it's the same kind of uh, background overview uh, stuff. Uh, you have that to help you get a good idea of the letter as a whole. I'm going to walk you through the letter via video, and then there'll also be some uh, homework assignments for you to do for me to show me that you understand what 1 Corinthians is about. Um, first off, uh, 1 Corinthians um, was written uh, during Paul's third missionary journey, and he founded the church in Corinth during his second missionary journey. And if you look in Acts, it's basically shortly after the whole Thessalonica thing that we did with Prince Thessalonians. He uh, went after his after after uh, Thessalonica. He fled Thessalonica, made his way to Athens. Um, that's mentioned, I believe, in uh, Acts sixteen. Um, let me see here. Yeah, Acts 16 or 17. And then uh, he makes his way to Corinth in chapter 18 in Acts. So he establishes the church in Corinth during his second missionary journey, and now the letters are written during his third missionary journey back to the church that he started during his second missionary journey. Now, the interesting thing about Corinth, and I'll probably put a map up here so you can see where it is, um, the city of Corinth has a very interesting background. Essentially, it had like what we call a double history. And what that means is it was first an ancient Greek city, um, and then it, but it got destroyed by Rome in 146 BC or BCE, whatever you want to call it. Um, <clears throat> and it lay dormant for about 100 years. And then in 44 BC... Uh, Julius Caesar rebuilt the city and reestablished it as a Roman colony. Um, so in Paul's day, this was still a fairly new city, the second, the second city of Corinth, so to speak. Um, by 52 AD, um, which would have been right around the time Paul is writing, is visiting Corinth and writing his letters, it had actually become uh, the third leading city of the Roman Empire because if you look on the map where it's situated, it's um, it, it was a big city on the trade route uh, for ships and stuff, so it got rich. It was a very lucrative, uh, rich city. Um, by the way, the top two cities were Rome and Alexandria. Corinth was number three. Um, so it was a very rich cosmopolitan city. Um, it was a port city. That's why that's what made it rich. Um, and along with that, being a port city and a rich city, it was, all, it was also known to be a very uh, pagan and immoral city. Um, in fact, uh, we know that there were like 27 different pagan temples in Corinth for all the different gods and goddesses. And if you know anything about pagan temples, uh, a lot of pagan temples had temple prostitution that was part of their worship. And so um, that was what Corinth was like. It was a rich, lecherous city. Um, if you want to think of it, it's kind of like a combination of, uh, what is what I have here, a combination of New York, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles all rolled into one. Obviously not that big population-wise, but that kind of feeling for it. So that's what Corinth that's what Corinth was like when Paul went there. Now, the little bit of background of Paul's time in Corinth is found in Acts 18, 1 through 17. Um, he had just left Thessalonica. He'd go down to Athens, given his famous Mars Hill speech. Um, that was the end of 17. Um, after that, he made his way to Corinth. And um, he ended up spending 18 months in Corinth. So it really wasn't just a stop on the journey. He'd like lived there for an hour, an hour and a half a year and a half, and that's when he established the church in Corinth. It was also, we also find out in 
Acts 15, is that while in Corinth, he teamed up with a, a, a husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla, and they were Jews, Jewish Christians, we could say Jewish Christians, um, who were forced to leave Rome in 49 AD when Claudius, the emperor, apparently issued an edict expelling all Jews from Rome because, apparently, there was some kind of hostile conflict among the Jews concerning a certain man that he called Christus, which a lot of scholars think that it's possibly he just got the name wrong, he was referring to Christ, and that therefore in 49 AD there was a lot of tension within the Jewish community of Rome over this issue of is Jesus the Messiah or not, and it got so contentious that apparently um, Claudius just kicked them all out of Rome for a while, and Aquila and Priscilla had been living in Rome, so they were kicked out. They came to Corinth, they teamed up with Paul, and they started the church in Corinth. So that's a little bit of background. Um, and uh, what you see is uh, the same pattern happens. Paul would go to Corinth. He started by preaching in the synagogues. Um, he attracted some Jews and a lot of the God-fearers, the Gentile God-fearers. Um, the rest of the Jews rejected him, so he's, that's how he ended up starting his own church. Um, and so, uh, let's see, in, in fact, in Acts 18, we're told that Chris, the, uh, the leader of the synagogue, Crispus, actually converted to Christianity. So the leader of the synagogue went to be with Paul and left the synagogue. Um, and so, uh, let's see here, any other background stuff? Um, at one point, and this is also in Acts 18, like the other cities that we've talked about, the ones in Galatia and Thessalonica, Thessalonica um, at some point uh, the Jews of the city try to conspire against Paul and rile up the population against him, and they brought him before, uh, not Galileo, uh, Galileo, um, who was the, uh, where is it, he, he was the new proconsul of the region, and we're told that they brought him brought Paul before him to accuse him of various things, and Galileo uh, basically saw that this was just some kind of Jewish spat, and he kicked them all out. He wasn't going to have anything to do with it. So, anyway, that is a little bit of background about the city of Corinth and Paul's time in Corinth. Um, another interesting side note that is interesting, an interesting side note that is interesting, is that when you look at... 1 Corinthians closely, and 2 Corinthians, um, Paul makes mention in 1 Corinthians of other letters that he had already written to the Corinthians that we don't have anymore. Um, so if you read it closely, you find out, for example, in 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11, he makes reference to an earlier letter he had written um, to them. Um, we don't have that one. So technically, 1 Corinthians, literally, we don't have. And um, then our, let's see, I want to get this right, because even, it's complicated. Um, yeah, so our 1 Corinthians is actually Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, but that's the only, that's the first one we have, so we call it 1 Corinthians. Um, and then we find out that um, in 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, he references another letter that he had written after 1 Corinthians that we don't have. And uh, then, therefore, what we have is 2 Corinthians is actually like the fourth letter of uh, the Corinthian correspondence. So, interestingly enough, when you read 1 and 2 Corinthians closely and what he refers to, we have 1 and 2 Corinthians, but in reality, the first letter we don't have, the second letter we have called 1 Corinthians, the third letter we don't have, and the second letter we have is, is the fourth letter, the second letter we have is called 4 Corinthians. Anyway, that's kind of a little interesting bit. But when you put it all together, it, it, we are able to flesh out a certain kind of timeline of what was going on um, with the Church of Corinth that caused him to write a lot of letters. And we'll get into that um, as we go through Corinthians. Um, now, um, the main issues, and if you look at the stuff I gave you, uh, 1 Corinthians is actually laid out in a really easy to understand way. Um, the long and short of the purpose of the letter is that there were divisions cropping up in the Corinthian church. And Paul is first and foremost writing to the Corinthian believers to address this, these growing divisions in the church. 
Um, in addition to that, they had sent him uh, some correspondence in which they had a number of questions about basically now that we're Christians living in a pagan society, what do we do with this, this, and this? Um, and so part of the letter is also Paul addressing those questions that they had already sent to him. So it's a very, what would they call it, an occasional letter. He's writing to specific issues that uh, were pressing. their divisions within the church and then these other questions that they had about uh, the Christian life. And so, basically, what we're going to try to do, we'll see how far I get. Maybe I can get through 1 Corinthians 1 through 7 today, specifically. Uh, this is fairly easy to understand the big chunks. Chapters 1 through 4 are all about him addressing these divisions that are cropping up in the Corinthian church. Okay? So let me get my notes out for real and talk you through it. All right. Um, after his initial introduction in the first nine verses, his typical greetings and thanksgiving, since this is 1 Corinthians and it's a long, I'm not going to read everything in 1 Corinthians. You could read it yourself. You could pause this and read the passage, and, and we can do it that way. Um, so after the initial greeting of the first nine verses, um, the verses 10, chapter 1, verses 10 through 17 is he, this is where he first addresses the problems in Corinth, okay? And you, and you see it right at the beginning. I'll read this a little bit. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's reported to me by Chloe's people, they are the people who brought him the questions, um, that there is some quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow, follow Cephas, Peter, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Well, I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. And it's funny, and right here, it's almost like he then, when he's dictating this letter, uh, he remembers he baptized somebody else. So he says in verse 16, oh, I, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, uh, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. So it's kind of interesting when you read it closely, this little throwaway line, it's like, I, I only baptized these two guys. Oh, wait, no. I did baptize that household too. But beyond that, nobody else. But his point is, he's addressing these divisions, and he wants them to be a united church. Um, for he said... 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. This is going to be a major uh, image, I guess you could say, that he brings out in these first couple chapters. What he's doing, he's pointing to the message of the gospel, the message of the cross, okay? And what he says in the rest of chapter 1 is he is calling their attention to what the cross symbolizes and to what the gospel is, and he contrasts that with the wisdom of the world. Um, because the Corinthian believers, being in Corinth and being a very cosmopolitan city, a Greek city, they were very, um, what's the word, uh, intrigued by, you know, philosophy and wisdom. And Paul wants to make sure that the actual message of the cross, the message of the gospel, is not really impressive by worldly standards. You know, it's not high, you know, the high flowering philosophy. And then here comes the gospel and says, yeah, there was a Jewish peasant who got crucified. It doesn't really sit well with people who want to think high and lofty thoughts. Um, so what he does is he put, points to his the word, the gospel of the, the cross, and he basically says in the rest of chapter 1, he says uh, the, the message of the cross, the gospel, is it's God's foolishness. It seems like utterly absurd. Um, it, but at the same time, God's foolishness is stronger than men's... How, how, I always get this wrong. Is, is stronger than men, and I mixed up my own uh, imagery. He says, he points to the cross and he says, this 
is, sounds bizarre and it sounds foolish. But God's foolishness, the way God does things, is wiser than men's wisdom, i.e. Greek philosophy and stuff like that. And then he says, yes, a person on the cross is utterly weak and vulnerable. This shows God's weakness, but God's weakness is still stronger than the strength of men. So he's, that's what he's setting up the gospel and the cross to be. Um, and so his whole point is, from the Greek perspective, the cross, the message of the cross seems utterly stupid and foolishness, moronic, if you will. All right? Um, on the other side, he's saying, from the Jewish perspective, the cross is a scandal, it's a stumbling block, because in the Jewish scriptures, it's clearly stated that cursed is anyone who hangs on the tree, on a tree. So from the Jewish perspective, the idea that the Jewish Messiah would be crucified is utterly blasphemous and disgusting to even consider. And so Paul is pointing to the message of the cross and he says, nobody in the world thinks it's awesome. The Jews are scandalized by it. The Greeks think it's a bunch of malarkey. I just thought I'd say malarkey. All right. And so what he says specifically, let me see if I can find it. Um, that's what a lot of the um, rest of chapter 1 is. But here, in verse 20, he says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made the foolish of made foolish the wisdom of the world? That bit, you kind of miss it in English, but um, who is the wise? He's like, who is the wise, it's implied, the wise philosopher, Greek type? Um, where's the scribe? That's a reference to uh, Jewish scribes. So he's contrasting the message of the gospel and the cross with both the Jewish way of seeing things and the Greek way of seeing things. He said this is a whole different thing. Um, so, uh, to the Jewish scribe, it's a stumbling block. To the Greek philosopher, it seems foolish. Um, and he says, basically, both of those groups don't like the cross and the message that I'm preaching to you. Okay? They are the world. That's what he's talking about. Okay. Now, um, he then, after he does that, look what he says in <clears throat> verse 26. For you, consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Translations, none of you guys were really all that special. <laughs> Let's be honest. Um, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. That means you guys. Even things that are not to bring nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. In fact, when you look throughout the entire Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, God has always chose choosing the lowly and meek, insignificant person to bring about his salvation and his plan. You see it all the time. And so that's what Paul is emphasizing. And by emphasizing that, he's urging the Corinthians not to try to, like, get a big head and think they're bigger than they really are. If you accept the cross of Christ, if you accept the gospel, that's a humbling thing. It's admitting, I'm not a wise philosopher, I'm not a Jewish scribe. I'm putting my lot in with this guy who was crucified, when everybody thinks is either foolish or a stumbling block. So that is what he pictures, um, that's what he puts forth in chapter 1. Then he continues with that in chapter 2 by talking about a different kind of wisdom. Okay, The wisdom that he's giving is not the wisdom of the Greek philosophers, it's the wisdom of the Spirit. Okay, And he makes this distinction between the different types of wisdom. This is a short chapter. I think I could read it. Um, starting in verse... Uh, let's start in verse 6. Uh, the first five verses he basically says, I, I didn't come to you in power and eloquent speech. Um, I came in the power of the Spirit, which is the wisdom of Christ. Starting in verse 6, he said, Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. Even though it sounds, the crucified Messiah sounds stupid to Greek philosophers, to those who really listen, it tr is true wisdom. Um, although it is not a wisdom of this age, or the rulers of this age, who are doomed to pass away. 
But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. Excuse me. These things God revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The natural person, that's the ESV, um, in Greek it's a, the, the soulish person. And this gets kind of gets back to what we talked about in the other books, walking according to the flesh, walking according to the spirit. What he calls the soulish person or the natural person or the person of the flesh, it's the two types of existence. That's why he talks about the ages. The old age way of living is being enslaved to the powers and the rulers of this age. It might be the wisdom of Greek, philosophy or its Jewish scribes, but that still is in bondage to the old age slavery. And you die to that through the cross in that those who are saved in the spirit with faith, um, it's a special kind of wisdom. Um, so he says, the natural or fleshly soulish person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but he himself to be judged by no one. For who has understanding of the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. All right. I'm reading the wrong translation. Well, it's, a, it's an okay translation. There's one more thing I want to point out in chapter 2. Hopefully that makes sense of how he's setting up the wisdom of the Spirit in contrast to the wisdom of the world. Okay. If you look in, Jap in verse 1, the ESV has, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Um, there is a some man manuscripts, and I think this is better, the mystery of God. Now, when you read the mystery of God, what is Paul talking about? It, it goes back to the whole Old Testament timeline, covenant, everything. And it's really, I'm going to simplify it for you. You go back to the Abrahamic covenant. Basically, God chooses Abraham to work through him to make him into a great nation, and through that nation, all nations will be blessed. That's kind of like the thesis statement of the Old Testament. Okay. Now, if you were there with Abraham at the time, you'd have these promises. You're like, how's that going to flesh itself out? You don't know. And then you go ahead to the ex Exodus, um, and you're like, okay, this is the great nation that he promised. Okay. But how is that going to, how is the, how we're going to get to the end result? We still don't know. Then you get to the Davidic covenant. Oh, he's going to use a king somehow to bring a blessing to all nations. But specifically, we don't know. So the mystery that Paul's talking is about is how is God going to bring to completion, bring to fulfillment the covenant and promises that he made with Abraham? The gospel, Paul says, is revealing that mystery. He's doing that through a crucified, resurrected Messiah and the outpouring of the Spirit. That is what the mystery that Paul is proclaiming, okay? That the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant has happened in the death and resurrection of Christ and the outpouring of the Spirit, and that's what he's about doing. That's what his, what his job is, okay? Sounds stupid in the eyes of the world and scandalous to his fellow Jews, but this is how it is, and this is true wisdom, and this is true power. That's what he's getting at. Now, in chapter 3, he goes in to specifically address the divisions. Okay, um, And he's saying the reason there are divisions among you is because you guys are getting too big of a head. And that is what he calls, uh, if you look at um, verse 1, uh, but I, brothers, could not ad address you as spiritual people. Think of, when he says spiritual people, think of, Holy Spirit people, people of the Spirit, not just general spirit people, okay? He's talking about, 
I couldn't address you as people empowered by the Holy Spirit, but as people of the flesh. Some translations say worldly, but he uses the word flesh. That gets back to this idea of the two-age understanding Jewish worldview that is tweaked in Christian worldview. Um, you, you guys are still... I can't speak to you as if you're empowered by the Spirit because you're still thinking like people of the flesh. Old age people. Okay? And so... He says, that is what is causing divisions among you. You're living and thinking according to the flesh, which is exactly what he says in Galatians with the works of the flesh, like we looked at last time. All right. Um, he then uses the analogy of a field. Um, he says, my job was to plant the seed of the gospel in you. Apollos came and he was obviously with the church of Corinth. He watered it. Um, but God's the one who's making it grow. So it's not like, me or Apollos, we're both in this together, and it's God's field. So he's saying, don't have divisions among you over it's, either it's me or Apollos. It's God's field, you're, you're, you're in God's field. All right. Um, then he uses another analogy in chapter 3, 10 through 17. In 3, 5 through 9 is the field analogy. In 10 through 17, he uses another analogy of that of a building. Okay, and he basically says, I'm like the master builder, I laid the foundation. Others, like Apollos, like Peter, like others, came and they built upon the foundation. Okay, but Christ is the foundation. It's still the same building. So don't be, you know, having divisions among you, whether it's I'm more important or Apollos is more important. We're still both working together for the building of um, Christ. So he says, therefore, you've got to watch how you build. He's using that analogy. All right. Now, also, the building he's talking about is really interesting. You see what kind of building he's talking about in verse 16. After all that building talk, he then says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. That's really important for two reasons. One... Old Testament temple imagery. You know, remember God, uh, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he said the temple's going to get destroyed. And the real temple is him. You know, and so therefore Christ's body, the church, is also known as Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. So he's using Old Testament temple imagery to give them definition as to who they are. But in addition, you have to realize that there in Corinth, there are 26 other pagan temples around. And therefore Paul's point is like, you don't go to these pagan temples. You, as the body of Christ, as the church, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So again, he's giving them a definition of how they are to view themselves, both against the backdrop of uh, the Jewish temple, but also in contrast with the pagan temples. Okay? Um, so, anyway, um, that is chapter 3. His point at the end, by the way, if you want to read 18 to 23... Um, you know, that's the verse, the wisdom of the world is folly to God. It kind of wraps up what he's been saying all along. All right? Um, so therefore, don't have divisions. Okay. Chapter 4. Let's see if I can get through chapter 4. And maybe a little more. Okay. Chapter 4, he then turns the spotlight on himself about his own ministry. Okay? And um, in it, he, he gets kind of, I don't want to say mocking, but he's kind of poking fun at their attempts to be worldly wise. They're taking pride in their wisdom, and he's trying to humble them a little bit, okay? And in uh, this, in chapter 4, he starts off with, this, this is how one should regard us. We're servants of Christ, stewards of the mysteries of God. Uh, moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will, be brought, uh, who will bring to light the things that are now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. And each one will receive the commendation from God. Okay. 
So it's like, this is where he's going to implore them, uh, be like me, okay? You guys are fostering divisions. I'm like Paul, I'm like Apollos. Uh, don't use that kind of fleshly way of thinking. Just try to imitate me, and I'm a servant, and I'm faithful. That's what you should do, all right? Um, and then he basically says in verse 6, me and Paul, Apollos, we're doing the same thing. Um, starting in verse 8, he gets a little sarcastic because one of the things the Corinthians had a problem with is that they were getting a little boastful about how wise they were and they were really attracted to that and this is what was causing the divisions. So in to kind of cut them down to size, he gets sarcastic starting in verse 8. He says, oh, already you have all you want. Read it from a sarcastic perspective. Uh, mindset, and you'll see what he's saying. Already you have become so rich. Oh, without us, you've become kings. And would you did reign so that I might share the, the rule with you? It's like, yeah, I wish you were kings, then I could get in on it with you. All that worldly wisdom. Um, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. Oh, but you are so wise. Because he's pointing to his own persecutions and his own trials. He's like, boy, we, we apostles, we're horrible. Look, at, we're getting beat up. Man, you guys are really awesome. He's kind of trying to put them in their place. Okay? So he goes through that in verse 14. He picks it up and says, I don't, I don't write these things to make you ashamed. <laughs> you know, I'm being sarcastic. I don't want to put you down too much, but come on. This division stuff ain't cool. All right? And then he calls again to them to be imitators of him. Um, and then he, uh, yeah, so if, if you understand that, if you read 1 through 4, chapters 1 through 4, it's addressing divisions. It's pointing to the gospel and the cross of Christ to address that temptation to go after the Jewish scribe or the Greek philosopher. See, the cross of Christ is not like those things. It's foolishness and weakness, and that's great. That's what you need to stick to. It keeps you humble. Okay? Now, at chapters 5 through 7, he then turns a page, and this is where he is starting to address some of the questions that they have, okay, that they sent to him. And it's really, it's set up fairly easily, fairly uh, straightforwardly. Um, the first part in chapter 5, 1 through well, it's chapter 5, 1 through 13. Apparently, there was one of the members of the church in Corinth was sleeping with and having sex with his mother-in-law. Okay? Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if the father is still around, but in any case, that's kind of icky. And they were writing to him about, hey, what do we do about this? And if you look in chapter 5, um, he gets on their case, and he basically, and the thing is, the bulk of his wrath, his, his ire, is directed at the church, not the man. Obviously, the man's doing something wrong, but he gets on the church's case for letting it go on. <laughs> like, this should not happen. And he kind of pokes fun at them. He's like, Even the pagans don't this, do this kind of stuff. You're worse than the pagans on this issue. And he then encourages them to say, kick this guy out until he reforms his ways. That's what it means um, when he says, uh, where is it? Uh, where is it? I thought... It... Oh, yeah. Um, verse 3. For though I'm absent in my body, I am present in spirit, as if I were present, I've already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now what he's saying there, he's not saying, you know, send him to hell. What that means, it's strong language, but basically it means you kick him out of the fellowship and and so he learns that he's doing what he's doing is wrong, and then hopefully he'll repent. 
you know, he'll, his flesh will be destroyed, not his literal flesh, but that fleshly mindset, and then he'll return and his spirit will be saved. So that is what Paul tells them to do regarding that moral dilemma with that guy. That's what chapter 5 is about. Then, in chapter 6, um, he brings up the issue of lawsuits. And apparently, um, and this is 6, 1 through 11, there were some Corinthian believers suing each other and taking their case before the, you know, the judge in Corinth, the pagan judge. And Paul's response is basically he gets on their case again for doing this. This is not a good thing. And to do this, he actually makes fun of them again because they, they pride themselves on being you know, so uh, uh, wise one of the things he says, like, you guys are suing each other. Aren't, aren't you wise enough in the church to deal with this problem on your own? Why do you need to go to a pagan judge to get judged by someone who isn't even part of the faith? And so he actually says, and this is a hard one to take when you think about it. He says, it's better if, if a brother wrongs you and you're out some money, it's better to let yourself be defrauded in, instead of taking this in front of the court. You're making the church look bad, and you're putting, you're putting yourself under the judgment of non-believers. Now, um, when I would teach this to high school kids, you know, I always, I always make a, 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 a modern uh, analogy, and this is the one I did with them. Um, I said, let's say you've been attending the church, your church for the past five years, and you and one of your business colleagues who goes to the same church um, have a falling out over a business uh, agreement account and, and you're out ten thousand dollars. You, you you think you might he might have cheated you out of ten thousand dollars. What do you do? Everybody in the class when I would present they're like, you gotta sue that guy. It's your money. And then I would read what Paul says in chapter six. And Paul clearly says, don't sue fellow believers over stuff like this. And everybody's like, no, that, but it's your money. What does that reveal? So what's Paul getting at? And so what I would what I would do then with the, the kids, it's like, okay, let's say you didn't sue your fellow churchgoer over the ten thousand dollars. How could it be resolved? And then you start thinking, how could it be resolved? How would Paul want it to be resolved? Well, maybe people in the church would uh, all donate money to rectify as much as they can your lost money. There's other ways, and this is, this is Paul's point. There's other ways to resolve things in the church than taking your grievances to a secular court. And that's a hard one to do, especially if you've been wronged and you really want to sue somebody. Um, that's a hard and tough word. But nevertheless, Paul says it. Okay, the third thing he addresses, so he addresses the, the, the moral problems he's addressing is the man with his mother-in-law, the issue of lawsuits, and then um, in the rest of chapter 6, in 12 through 20, sexual immorality. Now, what he's specifically talking about here is basically going to temple prostitutes. Okay, it's not just, just some general thing. He's specifically talking about going to temple prostitutes. And this is what he says. All things are lawful for me. He's quoting, and that's true. He's saying, he's saying as a Christian, I'm free in Christ. All things are lawful for me. But then he responds, but not all things are helpful. And then he quotes something else, all things are lawful for me, but I won't be dominated by anything. So what's he saying? He's getting to the heart of what it means to be free in Christ. Um, remember, like we said last time, the whole Torah dilemma. If you don't keep the Torah, you're sinning. And Paul says you don't have to keep the Torah. So apparently, some of the Corinthian believers thought, hey, we don't have to keep the Torah. That means we can go to the temple of Aphrodite and get a temple prostitute. Hey! We're free in Christ. Paul's writing, and basically what he says in this part is, um, yeah, you are free in Christ, but that doesn't give you the freedom to do something like really wrong and damaging. Okay. Um, again, it would be kind of like if the government all of a sudden made heroin legal. It's not against the law to do heroin. I'm still not going to do heroin. <laughs> okay, that's the mentality. Uh, that he's addressing. Um, and so what he does there, therefore, in this section, and this is where he says the famous verse in 19, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, 
uh, from whom you have whom you have from God are you are not your own you are bought with a price so glorify God in your body his whole point is freedom in Christ does not mean you are free to be uh, to go in and become dominated by the desires of your flesh okay literally um, and if we all know there's certain sins in the world that it's very easy to become addicted to and and that's what he's saying you have freedom in Christ yeah but certain things are really harmful. Don't use your freedom in Christ to do harmful things. So don't go to temple pagan prostitutes. So that's chapter 6. Finally, in chapter 7, we're going to finish chapter 7. This is a long... First Corinthians, First Corinthians is long. Chapter 7 is all about marriage. It's a Princess Bride reference. Um, and it's a fairly long chapter um but basically he gives if you read it closely he gives advice on uh, married couples one of the things he says if you're married um you know you belong to each other you're supposed to engage in sexual union when the other person wants to as much as you can it's what it is um now if you notice what he the way he does this in chapter seven i'll just point this out and then we'll be done this is a long long time uh, he starts off in verse 1. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, if you look closely, he'll quote something that they wrote to him, and then he elaborates. So, he says, Now, concerning the matters about you wrote, quote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's what some people in Corinth were teaching. You know, even, even within marriage, you shouldn't do it. Um, or you shouldn't get married in the first place, and you shouldn't have anything to do with women. His response comes later, and he basically says, well, yeah, that's good if you're gifted to not, you know, get married, but marriage still is a good thing. So he's giving his advice on how to deal with these issues. All right, and in the, in, and sometimes, like in verse 6, he points out that sometimes, this is just my opinion, like in verse 6. Now, as a concession, not as a command, I say this, verse 7, I wish that all were like myself, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. Paul himself is what we call a gifted celibate. He wasn't married, and he was okay with that. And he's basically saying, hey, I wish everybody was like me. But not everybody's like me, and you can get married. It's totally fine. Um, and he gives some advice to the unmarried. Um, he gives advice to the married in verse 10. He says, to the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. In that case, he's saying, this, this, this part is a command from the Lord. This isn't just my opinion. Um, so he, when you read it closely, he makes a distinction, but it's just his, his opinion and what he feels is from the Lord. All right. Um, then at the end, getting near the end of chapter 7, um, he points out, you know, he, the, when it gets right down to it, live in the position that you were called. Um, be, be, be content with where you are now, uh, you know, in light of the Lord's coming. That's basically what he's saying. Um and this is what he says in 19, which is kind of interesting because it's a variation of what he says in Galatians. He says, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. He doesn't mean Torah there. He means love God and love your neighbor. That's, the, that's all that matters. Not whether you're circumcised or not, whether you're, not, you're married or not. Focus on loving God and loving your neighbor. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. That's his point. And then he ends with chapter 7 by some um, uh, words to uh, those who are yet unmarried and those who are widowed. He gives um, a number of advice. You can read that as well. Um, and he basically gives his opinion, you know, the advantages of being married, the advantages of being unmarried. Um, but again, uh, if you read it, it, a lot of it is his personal opinion about these issues concerning marriage and singleness. So, but I'm not going to focus that too much on that. You can read it yourself. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. All right, that's enough for now. We got halfway through 1 Corinthians. It only is a 45-minute video. I hope you liked it. Um, in the next day or two, I will do the second part of 1 Corinthians, and um, you should be getting your um, assignments as well fairly soon. Thanks.